right, let's get started. Yeah, sounds good. All right. So welcome to the kickoff for the I am the Cavalry track. Um, and just to be really, really clear, we are not the Cavalry, you are. Uh, so we're going to give a, a quick five minute primer for anybody that's brand new to this. But uh, we, we actually launched here two years ago here at B-Size. So it's our two year birthday. Yeah. Um, and we're going to both frame the day, but also explain what the journey has been like thus far and why we're very encouraged by it. So two years ago, where were we? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, a little historical piece, you know, it started with a lot of conversations between Josh and I. Um, you know, my motivations for getting involved, we're, we're, we're different. We're different than Josh's. Um, my motivations for, for having these conversations and starting to talk about this had a lot to do with um, the criminalization of security research. Okay. Um, it was where my motivation started, and then it shifted to, you know, having conversations and talking about human life and public safety. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So just as a, a short introduction, uh, two years ago we were finally motivated enough that what we saw was uh, the problem statement that kind of unified us was that our dependence on connected technology was growing a lot faster than our ability to secure it. More specifically in areas that affected public safety and human life. So automobiles, maybe you saw those in the news recently, um, medical device hacking, critical infrastructure, the internet of everything basically being the internet of hackable things. So what kind of unified us, whether it was my research on Anonymous or his uh, juice cleanse nightmares about how we were going to have to get licenses to be security researchers or programmers or that we might increasingly criminalize this like we've seen in France and Germany and in South America and even domestically there's things like Wassenaar and whatnot. In fact, right now, Jan Ellis is talking about a lot of the laws that threaten, uh, if they're implemented incorrectly, they really threaten our profession and our hobby and what we do in, in a way that would not be so good for public safety. So initially when we launched, we said we wanted to address issues that affected body, mind, and soul. Body was the public safety issue. Mind was the increased criminalization of, of um, security talent, and soul was the mashup between civil liberties and cyber. And yes, we're going to say cyber a lot here because the people we're speaking to, that's the words that they use, right? And cyber's on the news every single night, and Congress critters use the word cyber, and part of being a good ambassador and the heart and soul of the cavalry movement is to be an ambassador. If you go to France, you don't speak in English. It's, you, know, you want to learn the language, learn the customs, you want to have the empathy to meet them more than halfway and find some common ground. So the idea behind the cavalry is we had looked high and deep as far as we could. We got pretty far along in our careers. We found the adults in Washington. We found the adults in Europe. And what we realized is the cavalry isn't coming. No one's coming to save us. For things like this, we are the voice of reason. We are the voice of technical literacy. And if we don't try to do some things and experiment and fail fast and iterate, then we're just going to be screaming in the darkness and talking amongst ourselves in the echo chamber. So while I have deep love for both of the debaters on the keynote stage, that cynicism isn't solving anything. And finding more and more zero days isn't really changing the incentive structure within which we find ourselves. So the cavalry was really just a personal statement that you would make that you're going to try something. And you're going to try to raise the conversation, get outside the echo chamber, and be that voice of reason. So we deliberately targeted public policymakers, the general public, and those four industries. Uh, very quickly, though, Bo, who wasn't even at our launch because he was presenting opposite of us, um, really jumped in head first. Uh, what was your, I guess, your introduction? Motivation. Uh, yeah, so I kind of got introduced in, to, to Josh over uh, some Yamazaki. And, Yamazaki, yeah. Um, in the speaker room that day, and, and really my motivation was just I saw that we have the ability to change things, to make things better. Um, now more so than ever uh, and so taking that um, instinct and putting it into action I saw a lot of promise in what uh, some of the security community had done uh, and this being one of the, the leading efforts uh, as well as some of the things that uh, a bunch of other people were talking about so the ability to actually influence change and to be effective to not just uh, continually be frustrated and banging our heads against the wall because we couldn't find that better way. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I was going to say, we, we introduced, on that first day, we introduced some, a concept that we, we called fuzzing the chain of influence, mm -hmm. um, which sort of goes back to you were saying, we're going to try, we're going to fail, yeah. we're going to keep trying, we're going to keep failing, and then we're going to, we're going to find, find ways to influence the right people and, and get the right people motivated. Um, and I think that's still true today. You know, we'll talk about some of the things we've been working on. But. So you'll see throughout the day, we're going to have to do a couple different chunks on the agenda. Um, we're going to have Karen, who's been really passionate, um, enthusiastic person willing to try to fuzz that chain of influence and be a good voice and be a good ambassador. 
We're also going to have a uh, focus on duocracy. So Chris Nickerson, Tim Krabeck, Bo, and uh, Todd Beardsley from the Metasploit Project. We're going to talk about how do you actually lead volunteer stuff, because our culture generally doesn't like to be joiners. Right? We're very solo actors. We don't like to do things in groups. So how do you actually get uh, progress and tangible results uh, in a duocracy? We're also going to have um, quite a bit of update on our progress with medical. And we've had some pretty stunning um, breakthroughs recently on making medical devices safer by working with the right stakeholders in the government, in the medical field, the right white hats at the right time, pulling in Katie Mazuris and others for the ISO uh, coordinated disclosure type stuff. So we're going to give an update on that later today. We also have had probably the most impact on the automotive industry. And while we didn't have a sexy video on Wired, um, we have built really serious trust relationships with these guys. And we have a few things to announce um, on that front this afternoon. Um, but one of the things we want to do is um, show some of our progress. We'll probably get to that in one or two minutes here. Um, there's a I had some things I was going to say today. I'm going to change my mind a little bit after having a fairly cynical dinner with lots of really good researchers that just have convinced themselves that nothing's going to work. And I think maybe one of the defining characteristics of this, and Katie Mazuris was the one who put it in our heads in the first place, it's not our technical skill that's making this thing work. It's our empathy. And I thought I was born without it, right? It's not the kind of trait you would think um, would be useful here. But she basically said, Josh, if we want to change the world, we have to change ourselves first. And we're really defeatist, we're really negative, we look for what's wrong with something. Um, if we're going to be effective teammates, we need to build those muscles. And the further we get into this experiment, two years later, every single thing that's worked has been because we looked for what was right with something. And we used the language of the target that we were speaking to, whether it was Congress critters, the FDA, the device manufacturer. You know, They have similar goals to you, they just have different experiences than you. And I think the heart, heart and soul here is when you see a, a coordinated disclosure policy come out from United, most of our friends pointed out everything wrong with the United disclosure policy. Instead of saying they're going to crawl and then walk and then run, and what we should do is celebrate it anytime someone says, we're not going to sue researchers who test stuff and, and report to us. We want to start that learning curve. And what isn't seen, because we don't get the headlines, and I don't mean to be negative here, but for a moment, what isn't seen is the treatment that United received from our friends, mocking their coordinated disclosure policy, got a different airline to, to decide not to do one. Right? Because these guys are they're putting a little baby toe in the water to see, maybe we'll just let people hack our website. And when their toe got bit off by vicious piranhas, who would ever get into the water? Right? So I'm not trying to judge us. I think the idea here is for this to work, it's not so much our technical prowess in our zero days. It's our willingness to be a helping hand instead of a pointing finger. It's our focus on future success instead of past failure. It's um, coming with an open heart to be a teammate instead of being someone telling them what they're doing wrong. It's encouraging the, ch the good choices they make so they start a journey. And what we want to do is if you look at Microsoft, it took them from you know, probably 15 years for their mean time to enlightenment. They used to, you know, our friends used to frame their letter on their wall saying, uh, here's the, the, the threat I got from Microsoft Legal about the bug I was going to report. And now they have Blue Hat, and they have six-figure cash prizes, and they treasure the collaboration. They need it. Their software development teams depend upon collaboration with third parties. So if that was a mean time to enlightenment of 15 years, we really need and want to compress that to three to five years for auto and medical, and things like that. So I would just encourage you for the next couple months, and the fact that you're in this room probably means you have a better attitude. but. There's plenty of things these guys are going to do wrong on their learning curve, but this is year one of their learning curve. And what we found is when we're patient with them, and when we engage them, we get invited in. We'll do a full day workshop with the Food and Drug Administration to what, two weeks ago? They'll have us asking questions. We're, we'll accelerate their learning curve. We'll understand why they're stuck and they can't do X, Y, Z like we want them to, but we'll find out they can do A, B, C instead. And I think that open heart is going to, it's the one thing that's going to change our fate. Because right now we're, you know, fighting a losing battle. And how do you win in a losing battle? You, you change the rules of the game. So between Jen Ellis, myself, there's some government folks in the room. I think I've done 200 congressional briefings. Jen's probably done 300. And we've gotten to the point now, and you're going to hear about this later in the car and medical thing, but the committees that are asking and forming law for automotive cyber safety are basing a lot of their questions and source material on the five star that we launched one year ago. So I would say two years into this, the experiment is working. Now it's slow, you have to build trust, 
And the people who have gotten involved have learned it's less about tech prowess and more about translation. Um, but if you want to decide that nothing's going to get fixed, um, there's plenty of people in the echo chamber to, uh, to, to console you. Uh, if you want to try some new things and you want to build some of those soft skills, um, we're finally seeing the fruits of that. And we have a couple surprises peppered throughout the day. One of those surprises is uh, right now. Right. Uh, so we've got some very good friends uh, in a lot of great places, like uh, in Europe, where Uh, like in Europe, where a um, little bit different than the U.S., where we've spent a lot of our time in the U.S. just because we're geographically located here, um, we've been able to to do to take kind of a different tack. In Europe, we've had some really good outreach, thanks to folks like Klaus um, and others who have really picked up the, the idea that we can get safer sooner. Uh, and one of those is uh, a company called Draeger, and uh, this is a, a quick video. We pre-recorded this because we know the demo gods being what they are. We can't count on any live demonstration over Skype. So uh, this is uh, Maybe say just who, a quick who, film. Who is Draeger? Yeah, so they'll introduce Draeger. Draeger's a, a large medical device manufacturer over in Europe. They do a lot of uh, other things as well as medical devices. Uh, so I'll, I'll let uh, Hans introduce himself and Draeger in this short video. Tech fail. Hey guys, I'm Hannes Molsen, the Product Security Manager of Draeger, and thereby responsible for maintaining and improving the security of all medical products. We are a 125-year-old family company from Lübeck, Germany, with nearly 14,000 employees creating technology for life. If you think you haven't heard of us, you still might have seen us, for example, in hospitals with our ventilators, monitoring solutions, or anesthesia machines, or you might have seen our oxygen tanks and masks being worn by firefighters or marines using our diving equipment. Whenever it comes to compressed air, you are very likely to come across our products. Customers, users, operators and patients that are connected to our devices, they literally entrust their lives to our products, which is why their safety is one of our top priorities. People get used to interconnected devices in their everyday life really fast. Their demand for smart appliances grows way faster than their need for security. It is important to make sure that our devices and systems are hardened enough to withstand a connected environment. Josh will instantly replace connected with exposed, so to stay with this term, exposing them adds a whole new class of threats. In the past, it was just the device in a close environment. Adversaries needed physical access to hack the device. This in turn means when a device was hacked, it was a targeted attack against that particular device. Now this changes when we start to interconnect all those devices, maybe over a hospital network. By exposing them, they appear in port scans. They can become subject to several forms of collateral damage, be it from malware like CryptoLocker, by automated scripts to run mining operations, cryptocurrency mining operations for example, or just the average computer virus. Connected devices can also be one stop on an adversary's path through the network to steal information, like patient data. But no matter how much you spend on training, software quality assurance, testing, and verification, there is still the programmer's law of nature, with its inevitable number of 5 to 50 flaws per thousand lines of code, and suddenly you go to fail. There are several types of vulnerabilities. The ones you fixed, the ones you know about, and the ones you don't know about. But the worst kind of vulnerability are those that you don't know about, but others do. For us vendors, a lot of those others might be you, excellent security researchers, acting in good faith and being a willing ally to us. At Draga, we would like to make it easy for you guys to reach us, which is why we are preparing a coordinated disclosure statement. The statement is in its review process right now, and in addition to internal feedback, we are also getting very valuable feedback from the security community, for example, from Bo Woods. Once published, it will be reachable via drago.com slash security. It gives you the contact email address, which is product-security at drago.com, together with our PGP public key so that you can encrypt the sensitive information that you sent to us. You can find the key also on public key servers. 
We give you some guidance on what you should include so that we can reproduce the issue faster. Plus, we'll describe what happens then and how you will be kept up to date or even be involved in the resolution. For now, it remains for me to wish you a great time in Las Vegas. Thank you very much for your attention and keep up the great work. We are all the cavalry. Very cool. Yeah, so uh, in case you missed that or in case the video didn't record it for posterity, um, that's a, a major medical device company committing publicly to engaging with this community um, on equal terms, on equal footing, uh, in an incredibly clueful way. Um, uh, Drager and, uh, and Hans are very smart about what they're doing and how they're doing it. They're very plugged into the security research community. Um, and some of the work from some of the people in this room have inspired them to be better. So that's uh, another commentary on everyone in this room being part of uh, getting things safer sooner. Yeah, so I mean, if you have worked in the medical device field, their legal teams and their PR teams are very closed, just like in the automotive industry, just like the airline industry. So to, for we basically found a really clueful, passionate hacker teammate in pretty much every one of these organizations desperately trying to do the right thing. And one of the things that I really liked about Hans was he tracked the, the cavalry stream, he tracked the, fi the five-star automotive cyber safety framework, which is designed for cars, but also meant for medical. And he's changing his program every time there's some positive press. He uses that as internal collateral to, to do what he always wanted to do in the first place. And there's people in this room at other medical device companies. If you know Mike Murray, he quit his own company he started to go work inside GE Medical to make things safer sooner from the inside. And he's been slowly adding people like Joe Ciccoli and other hackers to his staff to work on the inside. So I think this idea that um, these, these indices are clueless isn't really the case. What you have is really smart people trying to do the right thing who needed teammates on the outside. And if you ready your heart for it, and if you get engaged, uh, there's plenty of injection points for these things. There's also typically plenty of job opportunities to maybe stop being a, whatever we're doing here and getting upset with it, and maybe go inside and fix it. So I'm um, super encouraged that this is uh, typically something they won't want to do, but we're hoping other companies now follow suit and add a courting disclosure policy. And when you go read it, if there's things wrong with it, we will quietly work with them to grow and mature it, but please praise its existence because the alternative is an, a, a legal and adversarial tone with these companies. So we're a little short on time for the opening ceremony, about five minutes left, if I recall. Is that correct? Yeah, about five minutes to speak, and then we can throw it open for Q&A. OK, so I was too long-winded before, but one thing I want to point out for people that didn't see it is one year ago on our birthday, we published a five-star automotive cyber safety framework. And we're going to go into great detail on that later. But if you look past the word auto, there basically starts with premise zero is that all systems fail. So we've been taking the attitude not of scaring people, just saying these things will fail. Whether it's accidents or adversaries, they will fail. So there are really five ready postures towards failure. The casual one I, I basically say is tell us how you avoid failure. Tell us how you take help avoiding failure. Tell us how you notice and learn from failure. Tell us how you have a prompt and agile response to failure, and tell us how you contain and isolate failure. The more formal names are, uh, what is your safety by design? So tell your customers how you do your SDL. Second one is, do you have a published coordinated disclosure policy? Say you will not third, sue third-party researchers acting in good faith, which is a form of insulation for us against things like DMCA and CFAA, civil suits. Number three is, uh, do you have a black box to, to learn from failure? These guys were simultaneously screaming at us that there was no evidence of hacking. Well, none of them had any mechanism to ever have any evidence of hacking. So we want to break that circular logic. Number four, uh, do you have secure updates? So is your response time to a hack a manual USB key sent in the mail with a 3% uptake that could be Im implemented incorrectly? Or is it um, a full remote over-the-air update securely like BMW did, where all of their customers were patched before anyone knew they were even vulnerable? Right? So what we're trying to do is help them get over the hump on secure updates. And the last one about critical, separating critical systems from non-critical critical systems is who cares if the stereo gets hacked? Who cares if they blast it on the hip hop station? As long as it can't also shut off the brakes or kill the engine. And because we haven't segmented critical systems from non-critical systems, we don't want to fix one bug in one infotainment system in one vehicle manufacturer. We want to fix the industry by making sure that their future designs are separating the critical from non-critical. And by really focusing on less about by PCI checklists of security products that don't work, 
we really focused on avoiding failure, taking help, avoiding failure, noticing and learning from failure, prompt and agile response to failure, and containing and isolating failure. And Bo and others later will tell you what they're doing for the medical five-star. Um, but this, as the foundation of how do you create areas to collaborate together, has been one of the reasons the empathy has been working. So we have the heart of a servant, the willingness to, to speak their language, meet them at their level, start them on their journey. And most of them were doing some efforts within one or more of these product categories or these solution categories. But the idea is not that we're going to prevent these things from being hacked, it's that we're going to be readier when they do. And the ultimate goal, and my final word on this, I guess, is our intent two years ago is to make sure we were safer sooner. And I think the last couple of weeks we've seen and some of the surprises throughout the day is it's working. So we really hope that you uh, advocate, participate, and uh, start building those empathy muscles. Want to open up for some questions? Questions? Yeah, so we've got um, about five or six minutes for questions. Uh, we also, uh, courtesy of uh, the, uh, the phone system, the old-fashioned thing that uh, still runs pretty well, uh, we have Hans Molson from Drager on the line in case anybody wants to ask any questions of him. Karen, do you have a question or are you just stretching? There's, there's also a microphone right here, which be, you guys probably yeah. use that. This way it'll get captured in the recording. Yeah. Hi. So the question about uh, perhaps using the reputation of the people who are participating in order to support the vendor efforts. So right now, as far as I understand it from what I've read, it is done behind the scenes, like in direct work with the vendors. And you've said that there is a lot of uh, cynicism going around uh, about the vendor effort. So if it would be portrayed as a joint like effort with some of the people who are reputable researchers in the security community and presented as baby steps, as you mm -hmm. called it earlier, perhaps this would lower the level of cynicism, or at least frame oh. it in some way? So you're saying that when they come out with their according to disclosure policy, if one of us was jointly Right. If, it. Okay. if you were just, or at least framing it, right? Mm -hmm. Saying, okay, so this is not the best that could have been expected, but this is what they're trying to do, yep. and we are behind it. Or Co coordinated support of their, yeah. uh, of, their disc of their announcement of that right. type of policy. Yep. I, think the, I think the thing that breaks my heart is um, there were people that were planning to say, we're not going to see researchers, and they were going to announce it this week, and they're not going to do it anymore mm -hmm. because of, of a bunch of reasons. But... If we understand, and I don't want to treat them like children either. I think they're doing really good work. They're trying really hard. Some of them have been trying to get a coordinated disclosure policy for three years. Um, I'm just suggesting to us that some of us can change our conversation in the echo chamber to point out what people are doing right. Right. So lately, I have I used to ask people what was the best thing, the worst thing, key takeaway from any talk they heard. I've started asking people what was the biggest surprise or what was the best part, and that's all I ask. So I'm trying to change the pH balance of the way we talk to each other. Or how can we build on this? So you look at it like a little ember instead of a fire. Like we can, you know, put the ember out instantaneously, or we can, you know, cultivate it and foster it and turn it into a, a bigger issue. So I like your suggestion, though. Um, we could do more overt support, and I think we did that with BMW when they got hacked. Everyone was making fun of them, and we said, "Here's the five star. Here's two of the things they did really well. This is actually a success story. They didn't sue the researchers. They did an over-the-air update." During the over-the-air update, I don't know if you know read, if you read our post-mortem, they actually were passing the updates in the clear. But they noticed it and voluntarily told everybody in their announcement so that other people that might also have been passing their updates in the clear could start using it as a cell. So I, I, I think um, we should be focused on where we, we need to be as a society and where we want them to get to. And then understand it's going to take a lot of time to get them there. I don't want to be patient about it, but I want to be realistic about it, and that's where the give and take comes in. Anybody else? I think you could take some positive examples from well-known researchers that are uh, active in this particular area to come out and say, look, I reported to that vendor, and they were actually good, and they acted responsibly, and they uh, mm -hmm. like, did stuff. And because obviously, most of the time, in this disclosure is, is how badly the vendor reacted. Right. right. They tried to hide it. They, they said that fix it. They couldn't fix it, or the fix was broken, and that type of stuff. So yeah, I think there there needs to be some positive examples where researchers are satisfied to some degree with the response they got they got from the vendor. 
And that, that becomes, yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I think we need more of that. Um, I think what researchers we know run up against is that many of these organizations are so immature yeah. in their handling of these things. This is the first time they've ever had a critical vulnerability reported. And so that's where, where more companies having the accordion disclosure policy, right. we're going to be able to see those things. So the next time you know, you know, Drago receives a, somebody follows that process right. and basically goes through and actually has some success, we should then highlight that and celebrate it, that this is a success. If someone was to submit it to a company that does not have one of those policies, that's where the, you hear the horror stories from. Yeah, the, um, I was asked a couple times, and my answer varies depending on the day they ask me, but I said, if you could only do one star, which star would you do? And I think it's the coordinated disclosure policy, because I think that changes the idea that researchers are a threat to researchers are somebody that can help us. And as they get more bug types, they'll start to get better pattern recognition. Because the Microsoft SDL is pretty darn good right now, and they still have a lot of bugs every Super Tuesday. Um, so they, they went from the idea that people might find bugs to, oh wait, people are going to find the right bugs, we can prioritize the bugs, we can look for patterns of bugs, and it fueled a, a positive virtuous upward spiral. And I think once we can see that they can start to see us as teammates and a valuable uh, addition to their on-staff on security team, that's probably the right thing, which is why I was so discouraged to see us scare away a few this year. I still think a, a few of them might come through, and that's why we're, I'm extra thrilled with, uh, with Drager here for taking a leadership stance. I think what's going to happen as well is the free market's going to see, wait, this company cares about security more than these ones? We're going to put our business there. So it's not simply passing laws like you know, Rob Graham was poo-pooing. But we are actually working um, with several committees to make clueful, geek-designed policy changes as well that might actually make it easier to do the right thing. All right, I think Karen's up now, or do we have time? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Karen Elizari is going to come up next. Um, She's a, an awesome speaker. Uh, she spoke for us last year. She spoke at DEF CON last year. She's spoken at several TED conferences. So I think you're going to be really excited. And uh, she's got something special to say at the very end. So make sure you stick around. Yeah, there'll be little surprises throughout the day. But uh... Listen, guys and girls, while we get set up, it's going to take me a minute with the cables and stuff. I want to offer you a chance to have some exercise. So there's upgrades to first class today. Lots of seats in the front row. You see the talk, you'll enjoy it more. And uh, you know, just get up, move around, stretch your legs, move your shit. I might be amusing, but it's not a stand-up. So I'm not going to make fun of the people in the first row. So I promise I won't make fun of you if you come and sit in the front. You're very welcome. Feel free. And I have another request, a housekeeping request. Can we keep the door just open and have people come in and out? Because it's way more distracting to hear that people trying to close the door and not, you know, failing at closing the door. So let's just put this here, and I'm going to let the magicians take care of that stuff. I'll get mic'd up in a second. Here's the clicker also. Um, and uh, there's going to be something pretty special happening at the last couple minutes of the talk. So y'all want to be sticking around for that because it's something never before seen and never to be seen again, maybe. So, <laughs> all right. Um, you get that stuff set up. Looking good, looking good. Um, Mike, I need a loud mic. Yeah, let me see. Thank you so much. Testing. One, two, three, testing. One, two, three. Guys at the back row, Martin, can you hear me? Are you hearing me from? No, you can't hear me. It's not coming out. Okay, how about now? How about now? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You feeling good? You hearing me in the back row, everyone? Because I'm going to speak loud so we can have the door open and you're all going to hear me even if you're all the way in the back row. So I need the people at the back row to let me know if they're hearing me or not. Yes, you are? OK. Uh, another second to get this stuff set up. I need this stuff. Power plug is good. Yeah, that's going to be there. OK. If I need what? Let's just plug it in, man. Thank you. Muchas gracias. And the audio is going to come into here. So we need to have the audio coming into here. So we have audio, but it's at the very end. Oh, can you connect it, man? Thank you. <laughs> OK, guys. Uh, and is this the way the projector is supposed to look like, which is a trapezoid shape? Sort of trapezoid shape? OK. OK, let me get over here. Yes, good, good. Yes, good. 
this is working, okay. Um, we, we test uh, the sound later. Okay, guys and girls, boys and ladies, <laughs> gentlemen, and creatures of other genders, kinds, types, and races. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm extremely excited to be here today. And it's actually uh, not because I love hackers and B-sides and Vegas. It's actually because I was nearly blown up on the way over. So uh, this is not a, a mock picture. Actually, I was on this flight, TK-79 flight from Istanbul to San Francisco. Uh, this flight had an actual bomb threat. And uh, we had to do an emergency landing. We had the jets escorting us over Poland. We dumped all the fuel. It's a 777 heavy coming over the Atlantic. So it had to get rid of all the fuel before we could do the emergency landing. Uh, the captain of the flight made the decision to do the emergency landing. Uh, it was kind of freaky. I was kind of, uh, you know, very nervous about it. And we had the fire trucks and the Polish SWAT teams and the dogs sniffing out and all that, you know, the whole that circus happening on the jet, um, on the jetway in Poland. So, and all of this happened not because of uh, somebody hacking into the airplane. It happened because the captain actually thought it was an ISIS bomb. Uh, they found a cell phone on the plane and the captain made the decision. You don't have to, I mean, you can make an airplane crashing if you like, but you don't have to. I make a caricature of it. Anyway, this is the reason I'm actually very, very happy to be here, because the captain actually thought it was an ISIS bomb and made a decision to do the emergency landing. It's the first time that's ever happened to me. If it's ever happened to you, I hope it never does. It's very scary. So I'm very happy to be here today because I am alive and I didn't get blown up to pieces. Uh, however, when I got into Vegas to add insult to injury, uh, somebody stole my bags. And uh, I don't know if it's the DHS, the FBI, the Fed, other you know, three-letter agencies, uh, but all they took was my deodorant and my um, backup SD cards. And everything else was intact. So either it's a plot to disrupt deodorants at DEF CON, or it's a plot to disrupt other stuff. I'm not sure. <laughs> I guess we'll find out, and maybe I can find my deodorant as well. Uh, if not, I hope I'm OK, Smetting. So, uh, Here's the thing, planes, this is actually, it, it really happened to me, but this story ties into what I'm talking about today. Planes flying over the ocean is a real thing, and they can actually still get blown up, not because of, you know, United or because of Chris Roberts, poor guy, or, you know, great guy, and, you know, lots of compliments and, and other superlatives. Uh, actually, planes still get, you know, threats and real bomb threats and get blown up. And this really ties into what I want to talk to you all about today. Actually, I'm um, gonna jump right in there. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it, but I wanna talk to you about how our world is made up of bits and atoms, right? That's kind of clear, I think it's a statement kind of clear. And for the past 20 years in information security, we've been all about protecting bits, data, right? Bits and bytes and information and that kind of stuff. Now, um, did that just auto move? Because I didn't. Okay, I have to watch out. My slides have a mind of their own. This guy is Nick Negroponte from the MIT Media Lab. 20 years ago, he wrote a book called Being Digital, and he said one thing which stuck with everyone. He said, in 20 years, it's not going to be about the atoms and the molecules. It's all going to be about the bits and the bytes. And in a way, I think we can agree that, you know, he's got a point there. But guess what? We still have the atoms. And actually now we have more bits controlling more atoms. So that's very abstract. But what I mean is that we have more ways to use information to disrupt physical reality. And uh, that's why I like what I am the cavalry is doing, because I think it's all about the physical stuff. It's all about the physical, cybernetic, you know, uh, atoms that could ruin your day. Of course, bits could still ruin your day. If uh, you are uh, a member of the Ashley Medicine dating community, I don't know if you all heard about this. Uh, this happened last week, I think. I was actually on CNN right after this moment talking to Brooke Baldwin at Newsroom. She actually introduced me as a cyber hacker. That's the first time that's happened to me. So I now, you know, put in my intro, once called cyber hacker on CNN. I think uh, maybe that's why they stole my luggage. Anyway, uh, Ashley Madison dating site, you don't know it maybe. Uh, their tagline says it all. Life is short, have an affair. Life is short, have an affair. They have 37 million anonymous users. Turned out not so anonymous after all. So yes, bits could still ruin your life. Information could still, your, still ruin your life. Secret stuff could still your, ruin your life. And you know, um, Sony Pictures had a massive leak last year 
pretty terrible stuff for the Hollywood industry, but pretty great for Charlize Theron, uh, Academy Award nominated actress, because she was able to negotiate a fair fee, uh, an equal fee for her next uh, gig starring in Mad Max, if you haven't seen a great movie, because she saw in the emails leaked from Sony that she was not getting paid the same way as the guy actors. So these leaks, what they tell us is that secrets are gonna get out there at some point, and it could ruin somebody's day, but it also could do some good stuff. And that brings me to why people are so afraid of hackers. Us, uh, we are hackers, and what happens is that a lot of the times, the shit that we do shatters people's illusion. People think they're living in a safe world, they think they have privacy, they think they have secrets, and whether their secrets are on Ashley Madison, or they're on Gmail, or on, you know, wherever their secrets are, actually, I don't think they have any secrets from these guys, because these guys, don't charge money for the service, right? You don't pay to use Facebook, WhatsApp, or Instagram. What you pay with is your information. You pay with your choices, your decisions, the stuff that you do, the places you go to, the people you like, the people you don't like. All of that stuff, that's actually worth a ton of money. The movies you, you, you enjoy watching and interacting with, actually, did you know that if you upload something to YouTube, it kind of belongs to them? And it's, it's kind of crazy if you look into the rules of what it means when you upload video to there. So, all of this is happening because if you're on the internet and you're not paying for something, there are good chances you are the product, right? Have you all heard this one before? Maybe some of you, okay. Are you aliens, are you awake? Yes, some of you, good. All right, so basically this is all happening because of what uh, our good friend Miko Hippenen likes to say. Oh, look, I have a fire, fire thing in the middle of my slides, I just realized this. Is there a way we can move a little bit the projector so it's not on this, or can you see it okay? You can see it, okay. So I have read and accepted the terms of use. This is probably the biggest lie on the interwebs because nobody has read and accepted. I mean, nobody has read them. They just accept it, they click through. Even us who are hackers and you know, minded individuals, we never read these terms of use anyway. Now I have a sister who is a lawyer and she tells me about this stuff and she says, you know what? It's crazy, the stuff you're all accepting. She's not a hacker, she's a, she's a lawyer, like I said, and she's, She's done her uh, master's thesis only about the stuff that we are all agreeing to do. So we're agreeing to do some crazy stuff. And this is uh, what Miko Hippen from F-Secure calls the biggest lie on the interwebs. And basically, here's the reality. Our information is worth a lot of money. Everybody's information is worth a lot of money. And maybe, maybe we don't really have a lot of secrets anymore. Not us, not the other people. So really, maybe the future of cybersecurity is not about secret information. It's not about keeping things secret. It's not about privacy. Or it's not just about privacy and secrecy. I know this is a little bit of a uh, controversial claim here, but you know, stick with me for a little while more, have a coffee. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest also the flip side of that safe statement. If there are no more secrets and if our information is wor worth a lot of money, and it's worth a lot of money to the big guys, governments and corps, it also means that with the power of releasing information, you know, one person, maybe a couple of people, can change the world. They can influence governments, they can maybe uh, take down a corrupt uh, corporate, or, you know, uh, help Charlize Theron get an equal pay in her next movie, which is great for Hollywood actresses. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, in a few years, in this reality where there are no more secrets, maybe with the help of some hackers, the governments and the corporates will be as transparent and as exposed to us as we are to them. Maybe, it's one idea. And as you all know, uh, this is something I, I mention a lot, about 100 years ago, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis, here in the United States, he said that there is no better disinfectant than the light of day. And that releasing information is a cure for many social illnesses. And I very much liked that, that idea 100 years ago, but I think it still makes sense. So it's not about secrets. It's about a way of life. It's about our atoms. It's about the things that we're gonna trust. So I just wanted to get all that information and secrecy stuff out of the way before we move into the physical stuff. And the physical stuff could be one of these boats, $80 million super yachts that, you know, sailing on the Adriatic Sea. Stop me if you've heard this one before. You all heard this one before? No. Okay, $80 million super yacht about a team of researchers from a University of Austin, Texas using some GPS spoofing and a laptop worth like a thousand bucks can send it veering off course. So it is bits controlling 
atoms. Information controlling physical reality. And it's the same stuff, the same stuff that they use to take this yacht off course, same stuff they use to crash land the drone. And it's not new stuff. They did it a few years ago at the university, like I said, University of Austin in Texas. So what is happening here? With a thousand bucks, you can take down a thousand bucks worth of fiberglass or eighty million dollar worth of fiberglass. That's a little bit scary. So why is this happening? It is happening, I think, because of two reasons. One is convergence, and the second is multiplicity. And I will explain. When I talk about convergence, for years, people told us that very soon we're going to have one device that does everything. You know, if you've probably seen those images of how people used to have like a camera, an MP3 player, and a personal digital assistant, and I don't know, like a fax machine, and now it's all in your iPhone, or something like that. So everything is converging, the technology is all coming together. And we are told that this is, you know, going to keep happening. So at some point, we're only going to have one operating system, you know, one major computer programming language. But this is actually bullshit. There's actually more and more and more stuff and more and more types of technologies being connected and created every day. So it's not convergent at all. It's actually um, very diverse. Uh, but at the same time, we still have a lot of core things which are shared among everyone. And these are very vulnerable things. And what do I mean by that? Uh, thank you all, uh, by the way, for, for joining this uh, session. I hope I'm making some sense, because my brain has been very frazzled, and I've been on a bomb threat, and coffee, and jet lag, and it's like the perfect storm in my brain right now. So I'm happy that actually there are people here. <sighs> OK, let me ask you all. You all came over from all kinds of parts of the world. You all speak a few languages, I'd imagine. What would you think is the most popular language in the galaxy right now? Mandarin? I heard another one? Cobol. Cobol, OK. <laughs> good one, good one. Other guesses? C++. So actually, guys and ladies, math. Well, math is good, but it's kind of abstract. So I'm actually, you're right, but it's kind of abstract. So I'm actually talking about software language. Not a big surprise there. And it's more popular than Mandarin and English combined. And this is, of course, Java. So Java is on billions of devices. God help us all. We, yeah, God help us all. And this shit has been around for years, and we're still finding like zero days like every moment. And this stuff is not running like on laptops and web apps, right? It's running like ATMs and medical devices and cars. It's freaking running the Java, the Mars Curiosity rover on Mars. I mean, it's part of the OS. It's not the only thing running it, but it's part of the OS. So it is convergent. Everybody's using Java. But it's used for like a bunch of multiply different stuff. So can we protect robots on Mars the same way we protect mobile apps? Is it the same kind of mindset? I'm not sure. So this is like where the problem gets really complex. It's not just about information. It's not just about secrets. It's about the safety of this shit, which is a laser, ro you know, laser firing robot on Mars. And it's, you know, tweeting about it. So it's also about the safety of its Twitter feed. Same thing, but all using Java. But the problems are different. So I hope this brings to home the complexity of the problem that I'm trying to, to bring through here. And all of this stuff, these are the past, um, in the past 25 years, this is what Sourcefire have uh, released in a report a couple years ago. They looked at 25 years of vulnerabilities. These are the most, uh, the environments in which most severe bugs were found. So of course you could say it's the most popular ones, people find the bugs there. They don't look at the un unpopular stuff. Well, maybe that could be true, but we're still using this stuff, and a lot of it is very, very vulnerable, and we're still using, finding more and more bugs. Even though we've been had 25 years of finding bugs in this stuff, we're still finding more bugs. And now, all of this shit is connected to this new shit, an old shit. Uh, pardon my French, by the way. <laughs> Sorry if I'm hurting anyone's feelings with my, uh, yes? Your feelings. Ian Amit. Oh, you're so, you're so gentle. You're a kind white rose in the middle of the desert. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Have a drink, get over it. So, uh, this new stuff and old stuff, you know, GSM is not new, GPS is not new, RFID is not so much new. You know, this stuff is not very much new. Some of it is old, but it's connected in new ways. Never before connected in new ways to stuff running this stuff. So this is the complexity of the problem I'm talking about. It's not about secrets, it's about bits controlling atoms. I think I'm starting to get the message through to you guys. And of course, we have 
all kinds of vulnerabilities every day and all kinds of, you know, poodles and shell shocks and heart bleeds and, you know, stuff they haven't found a cool name and a logo for yet. I'm actually waiting to see if Marvel is going to do a superhero movie where the characters are software vulnerabilities. Because if they can give the lead part to a, like a raccoon in a tree, and you know, I think Heartbleed deserves its own movie. You know? So. Yeah, here's hoping, right? So uh, I actually recently, oh, maybe? Oh it's, a, oh, it's Bandit. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the talk, honey. He's so sweet. Uh, that's Grant's baby. Baby Grant, Grant's baby. Hey, hello, hello. Um, it's very, it's actually the first time I had a baby in the talk. I mean, not had a baby. <laughs> like I said, it might be amusing, but I'm not going to make fun of you guys, don't worry. Uh, okay, so we keep finding bugs. Bugs will be around. As long as humans write code and create technology, we'll have more and more bugs. And actually, companies are under severe pressure to put new technology out there faster than ever before and connect it to a bunch of other stuff. So if there is no way, even if they had the best intentions in mind, even if they had like a fantastic security team, even if they didn't have governments forcing them to put back doors in it, there is just no way they're going to secure all the things. It's just not going to happen. It would be naive of us to expect this to happen. And this is why the world needs hackers. This is why the world needs hackers. Because governments and companies and the people running all of these technologies they might find some of this stuff, and even if they're really kind-hearted and, you know, they want to make this stuff secure and they don't want to put any backdoors in it, well, guess what? There's still going to be a couple of those. So that's where hackers come into the pictures, and, and I think that's, like, basically only hackers can actually be that solution. So this is an idea I previously uh, discussed and called it the immune system for the technology age or the Internet. I think hackers are a part of the immune system. It's about finding the problems and making you know, making the problems go away by sparking a solution. Barnaby Jack said sometimes we have to demonstrate a threat to spark a solution. I'm very much inspired by that. I think that's very much, uh, you know, within the spirit of I am the cavalry. Uh, but I also want to, you know, I want to I wanna go back to that in a second. So this is an idea I actually presented last year at uh, something called TED. And uh, maybe you've heard about this event. It's a little bit of a big deal for me because the people on stage were like Bill Gates and and. Snowden via a robot, and me. So that was weird. But look, I almost got it to say lit. So I almost got the view count to say lit. Now, I have to say, I didn't mess with the view count. It's totally organic. And I guess at some point, it did say lit. But uh, you know, I was very hopeful uh, to get the message out. It looks like it did get out. So my message about hackers being the immune system kind of became viral in its own spirit. If you go to RSA or Blacka, You'll see five different companies talking about the immune system of the internet, uh, which is you know good and bad. I don't know. I think hackers are the immune system of the internet, and not like a security company. Uh, but uh, I can't sue them for you know spreading this idea onwards because that's kind of counterproductive. So I want I want to go back to something which I think is important to all of us. I think everybody is thinking and talking about this jeep hacking stuff, right? And it's so complicated to even talk about without offending anyone's feelings. I just want to say one thing about what is sometimes called um, stunt hacking, okay? I don't think it's a bad thing, personally. I think it has some impact. Uh, but I think one of, you know, probably the biggest impact of this stuff is that for people outside of our world, they start prioritizing control and trust and safety of, like, the atoms over the privacy and the secrets of the bits. And maybe it's OK that they prioritize this stuff for a little bit, because the atoms have not had the same amount of attention as the bits that we as an industry have been giving them. However, uh, you know, to put things in perspective, I don't think it's just about atoms or just about bits. Or to make it even more clear, we cannot choose one or the other. right? We cannot just choose to protect this stuff and not protect this stuff. It is connected inherently in a way that will never be separated. We're only going to get more wired and more connected, and this stuff is going to be like on the moon and Mars, and you know, but here in my pocket. It's all the same stuff. And so what can we do about it? A few things I suggest we can do before we move on to the more exciting part of today's presentation, which is going to happen in a couple of minutes, something pretty special. Uh, a few things we can do. We think about the atoms, not about the secrets. We keep thinking about them, and this is what I am the cavalry is pushing forward protecting the physical reality stuff. I think it's critical that we talk about it all the time. 
I sure talk about it all the time. And we try and find all the bugs. Like we help work, do what we can to make more bugs known. Because we gotta make the bugs known. There's no better disinfectant than the light of day. Right, this is very important. And think about an ecosystem. Think about the fact that there's no islands in cybersecurity. Maybe Richard Branson, the guy who started Virgin, maybe he has a private island to which he flies with a private jet. And he makes all his calls on his private Virgin mobile network, which he owns. And you know, he has everything set up privately. That's one guy. For the rest of us, we gotta figure this shit out. Unless you know you, you know, become one of Richard Branson's slaves, guests at the island, and uh, then you're good to go. Um, uh, I, I was actually offered a trip to this uh, island. It exists. Uh, they have a Bitcoin conference happening there. Uh, I declined politely. So this is us, guys. This is how the world sees us. And you know what? It's kind of scary, but it's also how we got to be. We got to be armed to the teeth. We got to be working together. We got to be you know, making a difference in the world. And we also got to make other people be like us or understand us. And we got to take this very scary image, which I put in Lego to make it a little bit less scary. OK, actually, somebody else made the image. I didn't make it. But you know, Lego people are less scary. So maybe if we are like this, but we are Lego people, people can relate to us more. I hope that makes sense. Now, <laughs> before we move on, uh, I want to just bring home one last point. It's really up to us here in this room. The cavalry is not coming. We are it. We totally are it. So guys, uh, that's a big responsibility. The future is all already here. This stuff is already happening. It really is about us if we can save this future uh, or not. So um, thank you for listening and participating. No, no applause yet, please. I want to ask you if you want to see the next part. So oh, I just realized I totally skipped my introduction about who I am. Well, you don't need to know that. I mean, you can Google it or something. I don't have a Wikipedia page, but you can figure it out. So uh, actually, a lot of, yeah, <laughs> I guess, uh, a lot of what I am about is because of this woman. And I think for a lot of people, it's like this. Angelina Jolie in 1995 film Hackers as Acid Burn. I was 14 when I saw this movie, and I was inspired, just deeply inspired. Keep the door open, guys. Just keep the door open. I'll speak up loudly. Keep the door open. Thank you. It's very distracting. The you need WD-40 on the door. You know what it is? OK. Uh, so this woman inspired me to be like a hacker and to think about it as something which is a good thing. I never for a minute, when I saw this movie, I never for a minute thought the hackers are the bad guys. I only thought the hackers were heroes. And that's what I keep thinking for the past 20 years. So this movie has done you know, quite a lot of impact. You can make fun of it, or you can admire it like I do, but the movie has made an impact. Angelina Jolie has made an impact on the cybersecurity industry, I think an undeniable impact. And so this movie just had its 20th anniversary. And I had a crazy idea a few hours ago, actually uh, 72 hours ago, somewhere in Sebastopol in Northern California, where I was camping out with a bunch of hackers at something called Foo Camp, which is an unconference. And I came out there and I just had a crazy idea. I realized, hey, it's 20 years for hackers. Let's do something cool. Let's make a fan version of Hackers from 1995. And this is a fan version in the spirit of what is called Sweding a movie. If you don't understand this, it's from a Michel Gondry film called Be Kind, Rewind, where they actually ha have a video library and they lose all the videos. And they have to recreate the videos themselves because people want to rent Ghostbusters. So they recreate Ghostbusters with aluminum foil in the library. And they call it the Sweden version of the movie. And it becomes more popular than all of the other stuff. So we tried to make a Swedish version, which means it's a mashup, cover, version, redo, you know, remix. Uh, it might make more sense than the original plot. It might not. Um, there were a lot of people involved, actually like 30 people involved. Some of these names you will recognize, and I'm going to let you, I mean, I suggest you stick around for the credits roll at the end of the film that we may see in a minute, because there's a lot of people you might know and love or hate, you know. Um, Spoiler? No, no spoiler. You know what? I let you find out for yourself. Uh, just before I screen this to you guys, I want to say this is a like totally a labor of love that these 30 people made happen in 24 freaking hours between Friday night and Saturday night after I nearly got blown up on a plane. So if it's kind of crazy, you know, bear with us. It's wacky, I think. Uh, maybe it's adorable. Who knows? 
It's never before seen footage, and it will never before, uh, never after be seen again unless it gets leaked, uh, I mean uploaded, <laughs> to the interwebs. Uh, but at this point, my friend at the console, hello, I'm speaking to you, I need to stop the video filming. So thank you all for watching.